Hi, everyone. My name is Ian. I work at the Fort Worth Public Library, and this is the Maker Showcase. Remember that the Maker Showcase happens every second Saturday of the month, where we focus in on a brand new maker each month and find out a little about them. Today, I'm joined by John, who is a maker, and I'm going to kind of let him describe what type of maker it is. But thank you very much for joining me today, John. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thanks. So what kind of maker are you and what kind of skills do you incorporate? Okay, I um, am a milliner, uh, first and foremost. I make hats, uh, gentlemen's hats, ladies' hats for uh, on stage and for movies. I um, do, am also a craftsperson, so I do some leather work and some metal work, uh, architecture for inside of puppets and things like that. So that's mostly me. It sounds like a lot of different skills that you've been incorporated in many different ways. So let's start off with the hats. How did okay. you get involved with being a milliner and what got you inspired to start it really? Well, I was going to be the best actor ever. And um, I went to school, uh, the University of Texas, um, and uh, we had to take classes uh, where all of the actors do a design uh, costumes and a set and lighting. And I um, really loved the um, the interest in the costumes. It was something I, I wasn't only acting so that I could wear costumes, but um, mostly I was just doing it for the costumes. So um, uh, once I decided to do that, um, I uh, started taking a bunch of classes, uh, the design classes, and then uh, the most interesting part was the crafts to me, building um, the actual hat. And we had um, Jim Glavin, who is the who is a milliner and um, does beautiful costume work, but um, he taught me, and I, I took every like a sponge, everything I could learn, and then uh, I went to. Um, South Carolina in the summertime for some um, opera festival and uh, did some crafts there and then moved to New York and did hats here. So that was, that's how I got here and doing hats. Um, sorry. Uh, no, um, that's awesome. I, <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I mostly did uh, women's hats. And since I changed uh, jobs in New York, I work at John Christensen now, and it's a costume company. Um, and I do uh, men's hats mostly now. Um, we don't do as many ladies' hats. So I love to just do hats whenever I can. That's yeah. awesome. And that's really interesting that you started off wanting to be kind of more the actor and fell yes. more in love with, with the hat making. Well, I, um, I always loved the the illusion painting a picture. And so um, being able to set all of the pieces in motion so that the actor can just put on a costume and it's easier for them, that, that I fell in love with, that little aspect of, you know, I've got the bows just right for the person and they're fastidious or whatever. And it's, it's really, getting all the pieces together from a, from a bunch of rough, uh, like the millinery felt and then the ribbons and the hat and, and getting it all um, steamed and quaffed perfectly. It's really, it brings me joy. I don't know. I just, uh, when I get a hat and it's just perfect, I just, you just know, and you're like, great, send it. Stop touching it. <laughs> but that, um, That's something kind of important. You, you touched a little bit on something that I feel is important in, in, artistry and making and there's a point when we just need to stop touching it we we don't oh. need to continue working on it because if we keep it i've had projects where i keep working on it and keep working on it and it just kind of falls apart have have you ever had that point yes um they they taught me um perfection is the hobgoblin of done it um everything is it you have to you have to have a like a, almost a, a meditative moment where you can set it down and look at it, you know, the next day, and then you can go, oh, wow, I, I did it. This is perfect, you know, or it's as close to perfect as I, is it, is it needs to be for this moment in time. 
Like uh, there's, you're always going to have a different ribbon or you could always get a, a better color or something, but um, it's important to know when, uh, when it's finished. And that's not always when it's perfect. It's just when the, when the hat or the, or the belt or the, the mask is, is just gorgeous. It's, it's, it's exactly what it is. And it's all that it is, as opposed to what you have, to, what you, what your mind thinks it needs to be sometimes. Uh, and that's, that took me a long time to figure out. Um, and sometimes I struggle with it, obviously, but um, uh, yeah, setting it down, doing another thing, coming back to it the next day and going, oh, you know, do you think we, we also, um, it's, uh, we have a mirrors in the room so that you can always, because if you're if you go like three feet away from it, then you can kind of see what the audience is going to see across the orchestra pit, and you go, "Oh, I've been working for four hours on this tiny little part that I can't see." Oh, great. Okay, yes, let's let's put it down. <laughs> so, yeah, there were definitely moments uh, being a lighting designer in college for me where I would. I would hyper focus on something and then realize, oh, only half or maybe even just a quarter of the audience is going to see that. So yes. I, I fully get that. And I fully understand that. Now, what are some of the materials that you're working with when you're making hats? I, I, I actually had a milliner on in December oh, cool. and uh, she was going through some amazing different materials that she was using. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you probably work with the same, but I'm curious to hear well, what you do. Um, for since I make so many things specifically for the stage um, or for dancers, they have to. We try to make them so that they could also go in a giant bin under a bunch of dancing cap shoes, and so we try to make them um, to last forever. Eight eight shows a week, you know, um, and so um, we do a lot of plastics. Uh, so we have. Um, we have a lot of, uh, we do felts and straw and cinema, all of the beautiful things. Um, but sometimes we hide inside of the hat, um, very hardcore wires, spring steel um, and uh, poly, let's see, wait, 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 polyethylene, um, which doesn't uh, tear as easily. So I'm constantly going to, uh, the same company that all of the set people go to to buy the nails and the screws and the bolts to get shelf liner, uh, which we found is an opaque plastic that um, makes like a bellhop hat very easily because you can sew it in a circle and you can sew it to itself. And it's a very nice thing. Whereas we used to use buckram, um, which is a lovely material from the past uh, that we use a lot still. Um, large sun hats that you have covered in um, beautiful fabrics would have a buckram base. Uh, the problem with that though, is when you get underneath the lights and you're sweating, uh, sometimes the hat will wilt with you and that's frowned upon. <laughs> and so we've, um, We've used uh, thermoplastics. Um, there's a, a specific product that was made. Uh, it was designed for to be uh, rapidly used for skiers who break their legs. And so um, it's you put it in boiling water um, or very warm water, and it becomes clear and moldable. And you laid it over the leg once it cooled enough, and um, and then it cools it's the perfect thing and then you can get them off the mountain. Well, we've been using it in masks because then we can easily put an actor in a chair, warm up some water, put it in, have a nice conversation and then lay it over their face and get an exact cast. And that's always gonna be more comfortable than if I try to make it to my face and then you have to wear it because my eyebrows are higher or my ears are in a weird place or my nose, people's faces are so strange. And so we've been using a lot of a lot of thermoplastics, which I didn't think I was ever going to need to know. So it is a lot of uh, temperatures, and then you would let it. You you know you okay. Well, I can touch it, but a normal person who doesn't touch hot things all the time, that's too hot. So we lay it on our uh, on the inside of our arm uh, to make sure that it's the right temperature. But um, but yeah, uh, plastics and hardcore metals, uh, spring steel piano wire. Um, 
things like that um, a lot of times, which I think surprises some people um, because they're so weak, they're such strange items. Like you have to, you go through the catalog and you're like, okay, hmm, let's order this and this and this, and then we'll, we'll get it and we'll see which one is most like what we want. Um, and so that's always fun. Uh, every few weeks we get a new package in the mail of some weird new thing that somebody's discovered. And it's always fun because we're like, oh, what happens if you boil it? What happens if you, what happens if you pull it really hard? What can it sew? Does it go under a sewing machine? Um, can I sew through it with my hands? <laughs> You sound, it, it almost sounds like, I mean, forgive me, but it almost sounds like being like a mad scientist being like, what can we do? What, how do we, how can we manipulate this? It is exactly like that. <laughs> um, we, we, um, I, I had to go back to high school and apologize to my math teacher when I told her that I would never need her skills um, because I'm constantly doing fractions to decimals. And that really plays an important part um, because we make so many strange things that uh, are for different people. And some of them are in England. So we're using centimeters and then we're translating it into inches and we're getting all of these weird measurements. And then I gotta tell you that remainder carrying the one, it is important or you just, it all falls apart. And so, um, and so yes, it, it's a little bit like, um, Christmas and a little bit like uh, your favorite uh, movie monster uh, scientist who's just going, oh my gosh, because the possibilities, we can't keep up. Like every time we get a new person in, we're like, okay, where were you from? What did you do? What, oh, you work at this shop. They use these things. And they're like, oh, well, we also use this. And we're like, oh, what is that? What is it? What's this new thing? Um, and so, yeah, uh, it, it Constantly reading is what I do. Um, safety data sheets, you know, is, the, is this toxic? Will this be toxic later? Is it, you know, is it toxic now, but not toxic when somebody wears it is very important because some of the glues that we use to bond um, like plastic to, um, to the felt on the inside, um, they're, they're very toxic. And so we have like masks and obviously protective gear, but then they don't, they're inert completely once they leave and they dry out. So um, what people are allergic to, a little bit doctor, very little doctor, but mostly just, okay, I have this metal. Can this touch their skin? Okay, no. Okay, what about this one? Okay, great. This one works. This one doesn't. Um, okay, great. How do we how do we how do we plate this in that metal so that that so that that won't be an allergic reaction that they have? Because um, when you're dealing with people who are, you know, for hours in something, it's it's there's always going to be some part of it that's like, okay, uh, we have a shop cat. Um, it doesn't come up to our floor because all of our things are around people's heads. And so, whereas you can dry clean the garment on the ground, sometimes getting cat hair out of a hat is something that you just can't do. And so we're, we kind of extra worry about things that we never thought I would have to worry about. I think yeah, absolutely. Worried. Because actor safety is so paramount whenever you're working yeah. on on shows and and making sure that everyone, not only the actors, but of course technicians and and everybody is safe while doing it is is extremely important. Um, I want to step back for a second and kind of unpack a little bit um, about you know when people see musicals or plays or you know they go to see a theater show they may not think about what happens on the other side of the walls what that what happens behind the scenes. And so yes. you touched a little bit on it, but like some people may not know that when somebody walks off stage and they have a quick change, they need to be able to literally change oh. their costume in a couple of seconds. And that hat may yes. get thrown across the entire stage. Yes. So it, it's important so for things to be rugged, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, on the outside edge of all of our brims, uh, uh, which is the, the flatter part of the larger hat. Um, we will put a piano wire 
and then we'll cover it in a nice ribbon so that you can't see it. But it basically, you can toss it against a wall, it will bounce and pop right back into its shape. Um, it's very resilient in that manner because, um, well, when we did, uh, we did the original hats for the Rockettes, the reindeer antlers. And so they have these little adorable bowler hats with reindeer antlers that light up. And they did, we were, we were horrified to know that at the end, they put their hats in the same large laundry hamper that they have their tap shoes in. And we were just like, oh, okay. So they're rocks. We have to make that felt a, an emboldened thing that nobody can break down. And so um, we switched, uh, there are um, alcohol-based hat sizes that stiffen, uh, stiffeners for hats. Um, and we had to switch to a more rugged, acetone based, which is something that you then have to do outside with a mask on, uh, just because um, too much, too much of that uh, getting into your system isn't, isn't good, uh, even though it's, you know, what you dip your fingers in when you're getting your fingernails done or something like that. Uh, that's little bowls and small doses. Um, but um, yeah, the, the surprising amount of toxins that go into things um, are, they're getting better. It used to be that the crafts people, um, the older people who taught me, uh, their hands shake. And that is um, a poison. That's a toluene um, usually, because you would just grab the barge out of uh, a strong shoe adhesive out of the tin, and it has several chemicals that are very dangerous and you would just rub it onto things with your hands and and so by the time I got here it was no you'll wear safety things you'll have gloves on you can't let it it doesn't touch your skin you have to have a full we had um little uh suits that zip in the middle and like um for a repairman uh for your uh we have the same we have the same suits that you would have in your garage uh, for the for everybody who's changing your tires and you would just take it off when you left the room and wash it because it just it's a it's a particulate that um, gets in the air and it and it gets everywhere and so um, you know at the time they knew it wasn't good but nobody cared nobody was thinking oh well when I'm eighty or seventy what's going to happen to me. Um, so it was all like acetone, you just, you know, put your hand in it and throw it on whatever you need. Um, and so what I've enjoyed is I've started being safer, but then the kids who are coming up after me are even like, oh my gosh, you used to do what? That's, that's, that's deadly. And you're like, no, what are you talking about? And then you read, you go back and brush up on this, the, the uh, MSDS, the, the sheets, uh, and you go, oh, Ron. Oh, it has that in it. Oh, so um, we we joke because if almost everything that we touch on a daily basis causes cancer or is known to cause cancer in California. It has it on every single label that I touch, and so I don't I don't want to go to California because I'm scared that I'll get cancer and die. But if I don't, if I just stay here, I'll be okay. Right. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for those at home, uh, you mentioned the MSDS, that's the material safety data sheets. You'll probably yes. hear that a lot. If you work with chemicals or if you are in an environment that works with yeah. chemicals or even just some uh, regular cleaners, a lot of times employers will provide an MSDS yeah. for those. So that way they can see what's what all they're dealing with and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, um, it says everything nicely. So that, I'm sorry. So that you just, it has a list of things like, oh, this, this does bad things with this. And it's a nice, they're very handy. Just yes. Google that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So uh, we have really dived deep into this world of okay, costuming yes, and and what all goes into it. So, But let's move on to your next kind of maker skill and, and talk about that. How did you get involved with that? Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Um, the internal structure of things um, I, I accidentally happened upon. Um, we did uh, Dracula, uh, the play. And um, at what point, at one point, uh, a coachman has an, um, a spike shoved through his chest because he's a vampire. And so he had to be wearing a suit 
uh, a period suit and then a spike had to shoot up and then he could react to it. And I, we were like, I don't know how to do that. What is that? That's that's strange. Okay, so we, we broke it down into, you know, we, we, we Googled some things and we found out that um, if you make a little plate that then has a, an arrow or a spike or whatever it is that needs to pretend, um, it's a, uh, we connect it all with a, a bike chain, uh, like your brake system on your bicycle. Um, and it has a little thing that you pull and much like the, when you hit the brakes, um, it pulls the cord, which causes the mechanism to open, which is that on your bike, it, it closes the brakes, but in ours, it opened up this little channel and a little stick uh, popped up like that from the inside layer of his chest um, on his shirt. And we were, we were so fascinated and had so much fun making that that then the next time they needed, um, it was uh, Richard III and he needed a scoliosis brace because that's what they decided to go with. And so we were using the same aluminum. We ordered more of it in, in different sizes and found out what would look really scary in a brace kind of way um, so that it would really exaggerate it. And then we made them off-puttingly at an angle so that he, a uh, perfectly normal actor, would could wear it, but then it just, it augmented his shape and it made him look bent and, um, and deformed. And so once we did that, then we were like, if we can brace, if we can make this outside thing, then we can make, um, we can do different things with hoop skirts. We can make them more substantial. Um, because before that we were using uh, steel bones and you can buy, um, uh, it used to be whale boning uh, and all of that. And now it's, now it's steel hoops. Well, we needed something stronger and it wouldn't collapse as much. So we used aluminum and we made an entire structure for underneath the dress so that an actress could walk into the dress from another part of stage and the whole dress would stand up and, it would, and then we put wheels on it. And then we found out that she could roll around in it. And it looked like she was wearing the dress, but it's really just kind of fitting around her like the little holders for antique Barbies with a little waist cincher in it. Um, and from there, <laughs> we moved on. Um, Disney on Ice wanted, um, they thought, we need to revamp the show. Let's add Lion King, because when I think of ice skating, I think Lion King. And so we made um, flamingos and we made their bodies out of um, aluminum and then we padded them out with foam. Um, and so we even made giraffes, which took two people dancing uh, one right in front of the other and they had eight foot necks and it was done with a puppet stick and they could move and watching them was just beautiful. Um, I did, however, see one fall and that was not beautiful, but um, they got right back up. I, I still don't know how they did that, they're professionals. Um, but um, yeah, uh, and they, uh, a little bit of help, but, um, but we made necks and things and, and, then, um, and then we started working with metal as a shop. So um, we now do we now do all kinds of strange things with with metal, and we we started with rivets, um, putting it together, and then found that sometimes those break, and so then we moved on to um, small nuts and bolts with locking washers, which didn't know anything about locking washers, but they have a nylon insert in them, and they keep them from unscrewing, and we we we. Slowly started moving into the area where costumes meet props um, in a real fun way. And I've talked to all my friends who do props, and they're like, "Yes, it's a disturbing trend. Customers are now making props. Props people are making costumes. Where's the line?" And so um, I had to go back, and I was like, "Hey, when you were in college, what books did you study from?" And they're like, "Oh, we read this. This is the Bible for you know everything we do." And I was like, oh, great, because we, we, were, um, we were reading 
uh, what they wore and uh, the way they wore it, uh, millinery from the neck up, all of these old books and, um, and tailoring books. And so I started then reading all the prop books and figuring out, oh, well, if we, if we make it out of this instead of that, and you can make it out of this metal and finding, finding out what's stronger, what treat, what I had to do an entire lesson on um, cold extruded aluminum as opposed to rolled heated aluminum. And there's just, it's a structural, it, it, it does crystalline structure on the inside of it and one is stronger than the other. And that's what makes it more important. And, and then all of the times you'll see the aluminums with these four numbers behind it. 60, uh, 60, 63, 60, 72, 70, 21, and they all have different hardnesses and different reasons why you use one and not the other. And um, and it was a whole new world that I was just like, ah, oh, I'm too old, I can't, I can't learn all of these things again. And then you start playing with it. And that's the fun part about it is that you you buy, you buy the same thing in the three different kinds, and then you go, okay, well, this one's easily bent. I can bend this one with my hands. The reason why we got all of them is so that we could do um, a ballet. Um, it's the Nutcracker for um, Colorado uh, ballet um, during the late unpleasantness, during the, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, they were nice enough and they had the money to hire all of the costume shops in New York to do a little part of their Christmas this year um, for their Nutcracker. And we were, we were all, just please just punch because I got to go back to work. But um, the same plastic that we used for the, uh, the I'm sorry, the same metal, we, the alu aluminums that we used for the, um, the ice skaters wouldn't work for 14 year old girls because we made them uh, kind of carousel horses that they wore and it looked like that they, um, they wore them with suspenders. So we just needed to make, I needed to make the internal shape so that we could carve foam and paint it and cover it with fabrics and make it all beautiful. But the inside of it is this terrifying structure of weird bolted together pieces of metal that are very sharp and very unpleasant, but um, but then move into this very nice uh, circular part for the for the ladies to stand in. And um, and the same heavy duty metals that the adults were carrying over um, wouldn't work. So we had to find something that was strong enough for to hold legs in place, but not so strong that, you know, it was going to be so heavy that they couldn't dance. So it's yeah, definitely. I'm definitely going with mad scientists here because yes. it sounds like a lot of experimentation and a lot of even you know going back and doing your research on different things to make sure that it's that it's that it's working well. All right, so we've talked a lot about um, your your kind of moving through the timeline here of your different maker <laughs> skills. The last part was. Uh, I believe you said it was leather work and, and maybe a little bit of foam as well. Can you tell me more about that? Yes. So um, in college, uh, we got to do a lot of uh, leather work, uh, distressing of belts and shoes to make them look worn or polished. And so I learned very quickly how to military spit, so spit shine shoes, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, using small amounts of water in your polish and really, really just hours of buffing those shoes. Um, but I was able to make an entire group of military boots look mirror finish perfect for stage every night. Um, but a lot of what I do now is actually taking the shoes apart. So um, there's, a, there's a happy medium between um, comfortable and actor safe shoes and making it look as dilapidated as it needs to for film or for the stage. Um, because you have to, you can't just put somebody in a shoe that's, you know, open anymore because you can seriously hurt yourself. They could fall off and into the orchestra pit if the bottom of the shoe folds under, like, because they say they want the shoes to talk, which is when you flop them like this, the bottom goes up and down. And it's very funny on stage, but it 
you have to have the right actor and the right moment and the right put togetherness of the shoe to make all of that come together. And so one of the most important things I've had to do recently is work with Dickinson. Um, they did uh, a section of the show during the Civil War. And so they wanted to show some soldiers and all of their shoes were brand new. And they gave them to me and they were a little bit decrepit. But one of the really interesting things was since they were period shoes, I got to see how period shoes are made, um, which is fascinating because they're held together. Um, these particular shoes, all of them, the boots were held together with wooden dowels, tiny little slivers of wood all cut perfectly all spikes that were sharp on one side and not, so they could be driven into this leather that was wet when they did it. And so I got to take them apart and save them because I had to put them back together again. And they had to look like they were, you know, um, covered in caked in mud and all of those things. But um, one of the notes I got was there aren't enough sharp teeth in this shoe. And I was like, teeth, there aren't any teeth in this. And they were talking about the little wooden pegs that are holding the shoes together. And they wanted it to be more, um, they were like, it looks like a jack-o-lantern now and we need it to have more regular teeth. And I was like, okay, so for this one person, more teeth. And so um, it's it's it was just really, I didn't know how fascinated I was going to be with shoes until I started like, slowly removing parts of them to make them because you do a little bit and you send a photo and they go what do you think about this and they're like more and so you do more and then they're like that is too much and then you're like oh my gosh now i've got to put it back together again how do i put it back together again um and so you take uh, i take a series of photos of what the shoe looks like you know, when it's before i touch it and then as i'm taking it apart so i can put it like any mechanism so you can put it all back together again um but um scoring that happy medium again is a little bit more of that when you're distressing something it's never going to be perfect because it's always going to be muddled and disturbed and you know very touched and worn um but finding the moment where it is enough that it goes on to be perfect for what they need um it was i had 12 pair of shoes at one time and it was like all of them had different notes um this one needs to be more this color. This one needs to be that. So I'm using um, leather dyes and uh, polishing and all the waxes that I have. And you get them to be the right color. But in doing that, you make them look new again. So then you have to destroy them back down. So you're using acetone or alcohol or all of the other sandpaper. And, um, and so that's all part of leather work, which come to find out, is also um, when my friends have belts that are too big. I am often known as the person who's like, your belt is too big, just, just give it to me. I'll take it to work, I'll put, I'll, yeah, you know, don't, um, because they just, they lose weight and then they just put another notch in the belt and then it just gets this really long tail. And I'm like, you look ridiculous here, come, come, Come back to me. It's the third belt loop. That's the one you're going for. Then you have the the fat day and the skinny day when you you know you move up and down, and then you have uh, you know two more just to grow on. Um, but but buy a new belt, you know, or 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 don't buy a new belt. Just let me take this one in, and then you'll be fine. Um, it's all that way. Um, and then you can do leather masks. Um, we do a lot of wetting leather. So you're sitting at the sink with a whole giant piece of leather, getting it wet and then stretching it over a form in order to get it smooth. And then if you wanna make armor, you pour boiling water on it and it shrinks up and it makes this really dense, hard knot. Um, and then sometimes you wanna make a beautiful line on a mask. And so you'll put a piece of fishing line behind it and when you do that, you, it'll read on the surface that there's just a slight little line. Um, but there's all these little weird fun tricks that you get when you start like, when you start using the leather that's wet as like it were clay or something. And you use kind of the same tools to get those uh, shapes in it. You can stamp it with um, stamps. Uh, you can do pretty much, I, sky's the limit. You can paint it with watercolor. Uh, you can paint it with acrylic paints. All, 
there's a whole bunch of fun stuff that we get to do uh, when we make leather masks. They get very excited and they're like, John, this is a fast mask. It's just gonna be a shape. You don't, doesn't get all the fancy whistles and things. And I'm like, well, okay. Um, and a lot of times it is, it is that because I want to do all of these. I have books and I'm like, oh, we could do this technique and this technique. And they're like, they just, they don't, they just want a mask, you know? They just, just leather. It just happens to be leather. You don't get to do all the things, and I'm like, fine. I had and, I had no idea that you kind of. I mean, it sounds almost like you're sculpting with clay. You, I think you even it, said you're sculpting with you're sculpting a mask like you would with clay. Yeah, it's it um it's a it's a lightweight tooling leather. Uh, usually comes in a, a tan color, and once you've gotten it, once you have it pulled over the shape, and it's um usually a stone uh, that you've. Uh, so we do uh, mold making. So we would take somebody's face um, and we cover them with uh, dental alginate, the stuff that you make teeth molds. Um, and then uh, we lay them back and that sets. And then we pour um, uh, stone. It's like concrete kind of, but um, it's, it's a stone, uh, different mixes for different things. And then you, in the very back of the face, uh, you embed a piece of wood um, and then the stone hardens. Uh, you pull the dental alginate off of it, and then you can take this. You can take the leather, stretch it around it, and, and hammer it into the wood with the nails. And then you have all of your basically the same carving tools you would with clay. The the, the um, they're not knives, but they're um, kind of shapes, spoons, and and hooks. And you just kind of start working. You just kind of um, push in in places, and then. Um, hammering in other places and, and it, 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 it like a well-fit pair of boots um, that you've had for 400 years where you can like actually see your foot in it. Um, it does kind of the same thing. Whereas instead of just having all of the time of getting caught in a rainstorm and then your shoes are wet and you have to walk in them to all the way home. And then, um, and then all of those things you do you force the leather to do at the very beginning. So um, your favorite pair of shoes that fits you so well, it's the same thing. Um, we just do it much more quickly. It's, it's uh, just like light speed for them. Yes, yes. <laughs> Basically yes. speeding up time, if you will. 100%. Interesting. Well, mm -hmm. when I was in theater, it's funny because I, 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 I always tell people when I have done shows or I've mm -hmm. worked on on different pieces that we we work the full gamut modern day to mm -hmm. to back in the 1800s I mean I we did all sorts of different things mm -hmm. so I know it's weird because I feel like I learned more history through learning these shows mm -hmm. and trying to do my research on what type of lighting would be uh would be actually had during that time period. It, do you find that similar or kind of, can you talk a little bit about your experience of, of yes. learning history, I guess? Um, one, my friends don't let me go through their photo albums anymore of when they were little because I find the photos of their parents and I take the photo, I take pictures and I'm like, oh, oh, this is 1960s. This is the seventies. Um, and for later things, honestly, um, Almost all of the Sears catalogs from all of history are on the computer now. And so if I want to know what somebody looked like in 1890, you know, whenever it is, I can actually go to the Sears, the Sears catalog and find what was being sold in America at that time. Or there are all of these other books in England. Um, there are periodicals where they would do um, etchings of like the costume of the day, like you know what what they wore, when they wore it, and um, and it's it's a secondary, so you know before photographs. Uh, but it's you get a real sense for it because the artistry that went into showing the most fashionable thing back then it's still the same. You want all of the ribbons just right. And, um, and then there are books on the techniques back then um, for millinery specifically and tailoring uh, and dressmaking, but all of the dressmakers and the tailors 
um, wanted people to come back for their look because they did it better than the other people. And so in all of their, I call them recipes, but their formulas on how to fit things to people, they'll leave out very important lines. Um, Taylor's notorious for this. Um, so you'll, you'll have the whole pattern done because it's all done with math and straight rulers and things. And so you've got your, your squares and everything. And then you're like, wait, but, but we never connected A to B or S T to V W. And it's just, and you, and what you learn over time is you make a line and you go to the fitting and they put the clothes on and then you fit it to the body. Um, and then you you go back to that pattern and you change it ever so slightly. And over time, when you're doing that same show time period again, you'll pull that pattern out because you're like, oh, they're kind of that size. And you'll um, you'll be like, okay, well, I need to add an inch here and take an inch out there. But you'll notice that one line that was that wasn't in the formula, um, and you'll start getting to be able to be where you can just draw it. So the same thing goes for hats. At, you get all of these things and then they go and finish it as you would. And you're like, no, 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 no. I have five wall ingredients. I don't know where they go, how they go together. Um, and so one of the one of the most fun things is we, we go and they're like, well, how do I do this? Oh, just finish it like you would. Um, and it's almost, this is cruel because it's, it's a full shutdown. And, and you're like, okay, well, you can do this, you can do this. And what they mean is if it's a straw hat, you do it this way. And there's like five ways that you can do it. If it's a felt hat, there are probably a hundred ways you could do it, but only a few that work really well. And you find the thing that, you know, that you, you do over and over again, and you learn when to wire this, when not to wire that. Um, sometimes the head size is, it gets a wire. Sometimes it's, too small and it would be ridiculous to put something there so you don't and and um and yeah um one of the funnest things though is to just go through old photos online of towns i i love photos of new york which is where i live because you can see that we there are photos of like just street corners of almost all of the buildings and some of them, and like most of them still exist in some form or another, but where everybody else is looking at the architecture, I'm getting that tiny image of the three spots that make up that person's hat or that person's neckerchief, or what are their shoes doing at that moment? You know, like, are they, are they wearing spats? Are they not? You know, what, what, what's who wearing now? And, and uh, yeah, I love, I, I fall I fallen in love with the history of clothing because now we don't have as much structure. Like there's not, you're going to wear a suit and a vest and a coat and an outer coat and then a hat because you're outside, you know, um, you just go outside. You don't have to think about, oh, oh no, is my vest clean? You know, have I, have I gone past the mirror and dusted off my hat perfectly and gotten all the fur laid down perfectly smooth, you know, so that I look perfect and presentable. Um, and I wish, sadly, that we would do that, but I also am lazy and so I don't want to. I wear, I wear the same shirt over and over again. And, and when I go to work, I look like a curmudgeon because I, I've ruined so many clothing, so, so much paint on my clothes, so much dye because somebody will be doing something and the particles just dance in the air and I'll be in the other room and then suddenly I'll wash my shirt the next time and it's violently purple. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't like purple. <laughs> Why are my clothes purple? And then you think back to it and you're like, oh, right. We did that dance piece and all of their clothes were purple, so. Yeah, yeah. that's the real danger of working in a workshop is you never mm -hmm. know quite what's going to end up on your shirt, whether yeah. it be dye, whether it be sawdust or, or all sorts of different things. Um, there's a video online. Uh, this was, a, uh, I think it came out in 2010, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. There's a video on YouTube where they actually go back a hundred years in fashion and the, this couple is dancing to music and they start walking through the different generations. And it was funny because I was able to pick out each 
change in costuming. I was able to pick out what decade they were in. And I'm like, oh, wow, I learned more about, <laughs> about fashion and what, yes. what people wore during those time periods just from all the theater that I've done rather than the history classes that I was in. It was, it was kind of comical. Um, so many people who go to movies with me will say, or go to plays and then just be like, I noticed that dress. I never noticed these things before, John, that it was the panel, like the, the material, which has a sheen when you look at it this way, it doesn't when you look at it upside down. And so they're like, I noticed that panel, didn't you? And I was like, yes, yes, I did. Why did you, you never used to notice. And they're like, you've ruined it all theater for me forever. And the lighting is the same way because, because when a light, randomly goes on and you're like, oh, oh, that's weird. I wonder if they used to stand over there or if it's just a, you know, I was, I was moving through too fast my cues and one just got stuck on at some point, you know? And it, it's, it, when everything is right and you don't notice it, it's the most perfect moment in theater. And it's like a blazing lightning bolt when it is, and I realized that there's probably 10 people in the audience who noticed that one thing that I can't get over. And, and um, but it is fun and infuriating all at the same time. Oh, um, absolutely. There is a video of, oh uh, no, I'm sorry, there are a series of photos online of people in art galleries in New York where they've cut the photo in half and it's turn of the century and the people in it, and then and then the color now version of people just in galleries. And it is so fun and striking to see just the difference of like, you know, little girls and all of their ribbons and their hats and their gloves and everything just to go, you know, to see a piece of art. And then and then now there could be a child draped over the velvet rope, and you're just like, it's a different time, but but they're still enjoying the art. They're still mesmerized by the thing that's beautiful in the world. So, eh, it, yeah. it it it's fascinating to watch, but it also um, sad and fun, terrible and beautiful. I guess <laughs> definitely, and I I definitely remember being a light designer, you were talking about, you know, the little things that people may or may not notice. I, I definitely, there was one specific color of light, a, a gel that I, that I would use in every single show. I didn't care how it was used, but I made sure it was like a game I played with myself where I'm like, I have to incorporate this one color, no matter where it is, I've got to put this one color in it because it was my favorite color of gel. So I always enjoyed finding ways to kind of slip it in and, and use it in, in, in different ways. Now, when you were, I, I always ask this question of my mm -hmm. guests. I, I always ask when you were growing up and I put growing up in yes. quotation marks because I feel like I haven't even, I don't even know what I want to be mm -hmm. when I grow up. So when you were growing up, was this something that you were thinking you were going to be doing or what, what did you want to be when you were growing up? When I was very little, I wanted to be a garbage man because they rode on the back of the truck and I wanted that freedom of life so much. And then my father took me to the trash can and was like, he just held my head over there for a little while and was like, do you want to be here all day long? And it was like, ah. Then I wanted to be a fireman because they also got to ride on the truck and they had ladders. Um, I never saw myself as um, even somebody who would do theater when I was little because I, I always liked to, to talk and tell stories, but I never knew that that could be something I could translate. Um, and so it wasn't until I got into college a little bit in theater in high school, but mostly in college that I realized that that you could tell a story. You didn't have to be on stage to, to do that. You could tell a story with, with, the, with choosing a shoe, a specific thing for a character. And it, and, and it doesn't, not to say that everything has to be like perfectly period because it doesn't and it's always fun to change things. <laughs> But, but when you get that right actor in the right, whatever that garment piece is, 
and it just electrifies it. And it's the same thing with lighting. Like if you get them in that beautiful pool of light and, and, it, and it's something that, that nobody's gonna notice, but in the back of their mind, it just ticks a little box and they just know that for whatever reason it's right. And, and that's what I've kind of always found myself wanting to do. And so I never thought of this as a career, but I, in the back of my mind, didn't know that I, it was always what I wanted to do. Like I am as passionate about, I, I, my friends talk about when they're going to retire. I can't wait, I'm gonna save all my money. And I'm like, why on earth would you stop doing what you're doing? And they're like, because I hate it. And I'm like, you need to change. <laughs> I wanna do this until I can't, until my, until my eyesight goes so bad or my hands can't you know, thread needles because I love always having something new. And it's whether it's a new product and I'm getting to, you know, tear it apart or see how long it'll last, you know. Um, I've always, I, my, my grandmother was very specific about it. She was like, you're gonna get married. Don't marry the person you fall in love with. Marry the person you like because you'll fall in and out of love for the rest of your life. But if you don't like somebody, and she goes, it's the same thing with your work. She goes, don't, don't be miserable doing what you're doing. Um, and she raised, she was a nurse. She did, she did, she was an army wife. She did all of these, she had an amazing life. And she goes, she, she was like, if I didn't like it, I stopped. And I moved on to what, like, does that mean that you'll always have the job that makes you happy? No, I've had several jobs that did not make me happy or fill me with joy, but they were getting me to the place where I could. And I have to say, there's a small group of, you always meet the same people in New York. Um, you, you travel in circles, you hear about the same people um, in, the, in the theater world. And I'm assuming everywhere else and all of, all of the different small worlds that everybody lives in that make a big world. But um, but the people who really love their job are the ones who meet at the back of the party or whatever it is, and they're just talking about plastic or they're talking about what wire they're using because they found something new and interesting and they just want, you know, oh, you haven't tried this, but you've got to, you know, and I've always, I've always loved that. So that's I, awesome. Yeah. I, I, it sounds like your grandmother was a very wise woman and some really good she, advice for she sure. Was. She, um, she oh, was. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. She was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to talk about who, who or what inspires you? Where do you get your inspiration from? Uh, I mean, it, it sounds like a little bit from your grandmother there with that, yes. with that awesome advice that she gave you. But uh, where do you get your inspiration from? And I know, again, in the theater world, you get your inspiration for different shows in different ways. But is there someone who, a, a person that has really inspired you through your maker journey? Um, yes, actually, there's, there's the, been several, obviously. Um, there is a gentleman uh, named Randy Carfano. He makes puppets and he makes mascots. He's a puppeteer. He's worked at Hinson. He's worked for every major place. And he is the nicest human being I have ever met in my entire life, always. And I don't understand it. I'm certainly not. Um, but but when he when, when the inspiration strikes him, you can always tell because he holds his pencil differently or the scalpel or whatever, he, whatever tool he's using. And there's this tiny little glint in his eye and you just know that he finally, he solved the math equation because everything is kind of like um, a Rubik's cube where you're just kind of turning it until it finally, you know, you get one side and you're like, ooh, I can work from here. Um, and, and his kind of joy for what he does, I, did, I hadn't seen all the time. And so every time I think of something that's tedious, he goes, he was like, well, it's, it's a meditation. You know, we don't, we don't want to do it. 
You have to do something 5,000 times. You know, sewing hats is tedious. There's tiny stitches that nobody can see. Um, but you have, to, you have to embrace what it is and move forward. Um, because there's always going to be something else next. It's just like, you know, it's just a hat. Uh, he would say, as I'm sewing um, a baseball cap for an egg that's going to the White House, and the, and the baseball cap, the egg is five feet tall, and it's the hat. Um, when I put it on my head, it goes down to about my belly button, and it's this huge dome that's just giant. And he's like, it's just a hat. And I'm like... Yes, Randy, it is just a hat as I'm doing hand sewing on the inside of it. But at the same time, it is. And that's kind of the way I look at anything. Like if I have to make a, a collar piece or a shoulder or a, or a dress kind of thing, I'm like, well, it's a hat for the waist. It's a hat for the arm. Um, and so he's, he's provided me inspiration in that. Uh, I mentioned Jim Glavin earlier. He is the one who got me started in millinery. He Watching, watching him steam a felt, just have it randomly on a, on a steamer and then pick it up and just delicately fold it in his hands. It's as, it's as beautiful as, as listening to classical music. It is, as, it is as calming and he knows exactly where to put the fold. And it's a place that I've, I fight with and I'm trying to get that moment, you know, and, and someday I, wa I want to be described that way, but I'm not, and I probably won't be. Um, they'll be like, oh, John, well, he was good people, but he wasn't gentle. <laughs> he, um, but um, Hugh Hansen, uh, who's now teaching at Carnegie Mellon taught me, when I got to New York, he taught me all of the millinery. He was like, okay, yes, what you learned in, what you learned in college was fun. This is how you do ribbons on a hat. And, um, and it was taking that hat back to him for like the eighth day in a row and him just unpinning them and being like, oh, what did you force these on? Were you, did you, and, and um, he, would, he would ask if I had used my hooves when I put the ribbons on. And it's a, it's a beautiful, um, we had a love hate relationship. Um, he, he was, always hard and the reason that he was was because he knew that I could and he knew that I could do better and he and I always and I would, I would take that sad hat to him and he would just be like oh I thought we were going to do it beautifully this time <laughs> and I knew that he meant he meant we talked about it you know I showed you this and you have to remember um uh, Martin Pacladinus was a f famous costume designer, and I, I wanted to make him happy every time he came in the shop. And, and I, I remember I sewed a strip straw hat, and I had sewn it three-eighths of an inch apart, and he wanted it a quarter of an inch apart, and that is a minute difference. And I knew from three feet away, you couldn't tell, he saw it from across a room and could tell. And he walked up and he, he was the one who was famous for saying, oh, I thought we were gonna make it beautiful. And he goes, and, and he, he would look at him and he would and he have these tiny little eyes and he would just stare through you and you would just be like, I'm gonna make you happy someday. And, um, and I did eventually once, um, but, um, but let's see. I'm trying to think now. When did That's I all good. That's... I made him happy once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one time he walked in and he goes, That's beautiful. Who did this? And I said, I did. And he goes, He looked, he looked past me for who did it. And I went, It was me. And Hugh, my boss, was like, No, it was John. John actually did this one from the beginning. And he goes, Oh, I didn't think you had it in you. And <laughs> I, and then everybody cackled because, because, I knew that he he would eventually be happy with something that I did. Um, um, uh, Greg Barnes, a huge costume designer, he did uh, Aladdin. He's done so many things. Um, hearing him belly laugh 
from something that you, some comical twist you put on a hat that he just kind of drew as a whimsy line in a sketch. And he was like, oh, I thought that was just kind of wind going past. And I was like, oh, I put a wire there. And, and I did the glitter thing. And he goes, that milkmaid's going to be amazing. Like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. Where did you get that idea? And I'm like, Your, his sketches were famously large. They're like giant and they have rhinestones and glitter and everything you could ever want. And you can look at it and you know exactly what it's made out of. Because when you're a good, when you're, when, when you know your fabrics and things uh, and you're designing something, you can do those tiny little lines that mean, oh, this is a hound's tooth. This is like a subtle pattern that's just, you know, but, when you've done it for a thousand years, you look at it and you go, oh, that's a straw hat. Oh, and it's got a beautiful ribbon. Okay, I can find this ribbon. I know exactly where to go. So, you know, you pick up all the things. But um, but yes, and he would just belly laugh and just this roar of laughter and just, just loved what you did. And those, the joy that people brought into the room with them just they fill the whole world with wind just air you know um and even even martin pacladinas who i don't think ever ever filled the room with joy he still when you did it right and you had it he always knew what he wanted and when you got there he was always very pleasant like he knew and he would and he would tell you that you had done a good job you always knew where you stood um good or bad <laughs> but um yeah uh, i've i've had the pleasure of working with some amazing people um uh cheetah rivera brought in a pair of shoes because she was going back into chicago for the eight thousand um reunion of you know when when it finally hit i think was it 50 years it it, it hit a moment and they they got kind of the whole cast back and she had her favorite pair of shoes and she wanted them they were covered in rhinestones and she goes can you get the rhinestones off and we were like and what we were what we were taught to say anytime anybody came in was oh well let me see what i can do because saying no that's impossible like i can't get rhinestone glue out of ancient satin shoes it'll be easier for me to just cover them with something but with the right solvents uh david who sat across the table from me was able to get all of the glue off and we i still don't know he let he stayed there late one night and i think it might have been elves cobbling elves that helped him but she came in the next day and one thing that I remember is she talked to every single person who was sewing, who was hand sewing, and she was just, she was there with you, and she was so nice. Um, I remember we, we were, we had a little glass enclosure where we were, it was like a little, uh, it was a little cubicle uh, where we had made all of our things, because we did stinky, nasty uh, things, and so none of the other people wanted us part. So, um, so we were in our little, our, our little, um, our little aquarium, we called it. And she saw the shoes. She was so taken aback. She put them on immediately. She sat down in my chair and she stood against the one door that was closed and the other door was open. And she put her leg up and onto the door and, and the knee right about her face and went, and she went, she took her foot and just kind of did this with it while standing on one foot, balancing perfectly and just admired what David had done and was like, they're perfect. And, and hearing anybody say that, hearing, my watch, hearing anybody just light up a room, fill up a room with gratitude, I think those people, um, whether they're outwardly nice or not, bring power. And when they tell you that you've done a good job, it's like it's like uh, 
it is. It's like hearing classical music in your head. You're just, you just, you reach an, a moment where you're like, this person who demands exact, exacting standards thinks what I did was great. And they're all so wonderful people that I, I love them all and desperately like working with them. I want to work with them again. So Absolutely. They can come back. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember moments like that and, and people that I, that I enjoy that exactly as you described, it just, it makes all the difference in the world. And it really, it because really is amazing. You, you trudge through theater schedules and, and you know that it's going to be a miserable 48 hours of just tech and you, you, you're in a theater and you're like, okay, all I got to do is make sure that this hat fits. And that's, that's my one job. And then you help other people because somebody has an emergency and then, you know, it's a family. And then um, when, and then you have these brief moments of just beauty when the right person is doing the right thing. And then, and they just come in and, and I think the, just being nice, <laughs> like really just being pleasant to people. You don't have to be, you know, overly nice, but you know, great uh, gratitude is one Absolutely. of the, it, all of the people who have helped me along my my trail have seen something in me that they could that could be better and have been magnanimous enough to like step down and go, hey. Um, I can remember my high school teacher in theater, and she grabbed me by the ear and said. Um, you can't be in this play. And I was like, what? And she goes, your accent is too strong. Um, and I'm from Texas. And I was like, what accent? And she goes, exactly. And, um, and, from, and from learning standard American English all the way to everything, I've, I don't know, I'm standing on the shoulder of great people who have paved the way and, uh, and really done a beautiful job for me teaching. That, that's so awesome. That's yeah. really awesome. Now, for people who are interested, our next generation of, of people who want to get involved in theater or costuming or creation, yes. what, what would you suggest that they kind of start off with? Obviously, the tools and, and just getting into the industry can be difficult, but somebody who just kind of wants to start exploring the options that are out there and exploring their skill and exploring the art form, what, what would you suggest they do? Um, there are... Um, 18 billion YouTube videos on everything that you could ever want to do. And the, the, the best thing I can say is find, not necessarily a YouTube video that you like, but find something that you want to do. If you want to make a hat, then um, start with simple things that you have around the house. You can make a beautiful hat out of paper. Um, you can fold the flowers. You can make ribbon out of paper. You can do all of these things with what you have. Um, you can go and buy an old hat at, um, at an antique store, or not an antique store, at a Goodwill or a, a thrift shop. Um, and you can turn almost any hat into something else. Um, but, but buy it, see how it was made, um, and practice. I would say learning to sew is very important if you're going to do a costume. Obviously, um, most, most places, uh, most theaters specifically, will allow you, I found a lot of costume shops that will allow you to come and sew on buttons or they'll move you on to something else. And then when it's not as hectic, you can try other things. Um, community theaters are great places to start. Um, you, let's see. If you'd like to be told to finish the hat as you would, um, From the Neck Up is a wonderful book to have. Every, every milliner that I've ever met has it. We hate it for the same reasons. We love it for the same reasons because it talks about every single piece of a hat that you need and it's online. Um, you can find copies of it. Um, you don't, I mean, you don't have to buy copies. You can find it. It's an old enough book that it is, I believe in public domain. Um, but um, it, it talks about all the different treatments 
And whether or not it tells you how to put all of them together, it does tell you all the steps. Um, it, it goes through kind of everything. It's a fun book. Um, it's annoying. It's a hateful book because it doesn't answer all of the questions you have to pick and you have to read the whole thing and then connect the dots. Um, but, but honestly, if you can find a hat that you like, if you can find a shoe that you like, um, local colleges have classes. Um, you can take a cobbler in class. They have them, they exist. I know I've done them. They're so much fun. And I wish that I could spend my entire life just making small shoes for individual people for countless amounts of money, but I, I can't, I'm not that, I'm not that person. But um, if you can find a hat, then try and reproduce it, honestly. Um, I have turned, ha I have gone to the gardening store and bought um, straw baskets and I have used those in hats on stage. Um, if there is not a budget, I will find what I can, but you can find straw pieces in just about anything and you can sew them together. Um, and don't be, don't worry about not having whatever somebody's telling you that you have to have. Um, just try. Do what you can. If sewing, and if you know that sewing isn't your greatest skill, you can practice. That's a nice thing about sewing is um, it is a machine that's doing it and you're just guiding the fabric through or whatever it is. Um, it is an obtainable skill. Um, hand sewing, I would start by embroidery, do some cross stitches, move from cross stitching to um, embroidery, do like letters. Um, I spend time at night because my hands don't want to stop at the end of the day. And so I do, I do uh, crafts, tea towels. I love a good tea towel. You can buy, you can buy entire sets, you iron on it, you sew on the lines. It's just like painting with color. Um, you're just doing it with thread. And, um, and they're ridiculous and silly. And then at Christmas time, everybody gets a Monday through Friday tea towel because you've done enough or open an Etsy store. I'm not exactly sure what you do. I just bring piles of things in and I'm like, okay, anybody want that? Okay, great. If not, we're burning it. And they're like, these are, you can't burn them. And I'm like, I can do whatever I want with them. I made them. This is my, this is my, this is what I do to turn my brain off. I've taken up whittling now. I make spoons. I bring in piles of spoons. And now we dye pots in handmade spoons because it's just find a craft that you like and just do it. Get good at it. Get comfortable doing the things that you like doing. And then, and then find a job that will allow you to buy the things that you need. Um, there's, a, there's a fine line I found between um, crafting and hoarding. Um, I run on the wrong side of that quite often. And so you have to be careful um, because if, once somebody knows you do something, then you'll get all of their grandmothers when they, when they pass away or when they move or when they downsize, they're like, oh, oh, you do this, oh, here. And then you have a, and then you have a small box and then you have a larger box and then you have an apartment. And in New York, it's not very nice to do that. So, so don't. Yeah, um, it can be it can be hard to to hit that line of when yeah. is it hoarding and when is it yeah. uh, still still just a hobby. When when it can avalanche upon you and and hurt you, it is no longer a hobby. As I've been described, <laughs> that's yeah, what they I, tell me. <laughs> I probably need to go through some of my. But anyways, that's that's a topic yes. for another day. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk about this. And I really hope you inspired some of our future thespians and, and also the, the technicians behind the scenes. Uh, and we'll, we'll have the next generation get inspired by this. Definitely. Everybody, I mean, it's a dream. I moved to New York and became a millionaire. Um, you can do anything. You just have to try and you just you just keep trying you know um millinery is a passion um and i love it and would do it all my life until i can't do it anymore um 
and probably distressing shoes would be the second one just to see what they're made out of. But um, I have loved this. This is amazing. But I hope that that I have at least not turned anybody off to millinery because it's very fun. Feathers, so many feathers, all kinds of feathers, and so many different kinds. So, you know, please do your passions, <laughs> join the theater. Good Support advice. The Support the arts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Good advice. John, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. And don't forget, everyone, we do the Maker Showcase interview every second Saturday of the month. So join me next month to see who my guest is going to be. Thanks. <laughs>